The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act gets extended for another five years, this time on ThreatWire. Hello, welcome to ThreatWire. My name is Darren Kitchen, and this is your summary of what is threatening our security, our privacy, and our internet freedom. And we're just going to go ahead and start right off with FISA. It is 2013, and it would have been the demise of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That is, of course, until President Barack Obama signed into law a five-year extension. Now, the Act of Congress, which was originally enacted by Jimmy Carter in 1978, allows the United States government to collect, quote, foreign intelligence information by foreign powers without a court order. This includes electronic surveillance like phone calls, emails, as well as physical searches. The law is limited on how it applies to U.S. citizens. For example, probable cause must be shown that, quote, the target of the surveillance is a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. That would be like a spy, I guess. However, the act came under much scrutiny in 2005 when the New York Times published an article describing the domestic warrantless wiretapping authorized by President Bush. And I say whistleblower Bill Binney, or Biney, who uh, worked as for the agency for decades, revealed that since 9-11, the NSA has intercepted between 15 and 20 trillion communications. Now, FISA was recently challenged in Clapper versus Amnesty International after the second U.S. Court of Appeals ruled that the laws have legal standing to challenge, although this was actually shot down by the Supreme Court. Leading up to the December 31st, 2012 FISA expiration deadline, which was added in the 2008 amendment by Congress, uh, Congress was actually seeking to extend the bill without any sort of debate. And a big push from the EFF, the ACLU, Demand Progress, and the Free Press urged citizens to tweet, to call, to email their senators, and uh, let them know about this matter. And likely due to this, the debate was heard last Thursday. Now, three attempts were made to add oversight and privacy safeguards to the act, each of which were rejected by the Senate. Now, Senator Ron Wyden, a Democrat from Oregon, compared the NSA to British officials who broadly used royal writ, or written orders, to invade colonists' homes prior to the American Revolution, which eventually led to the Fourth Amendment, which is kind of a funny paradox in this case. Now, Wyden says, quote, it's never okay, never okay for government officials to use a general warrant to deliberately invade the privacy of a law-abiding American. He goes on to say it wasn't okay for constables and customs officials to do it in the colonial days and it's not okay for the National Security Agency to do it today. Senator Jeff Merkley, a Democrat from Oregon, offered an amendment to force the government to declassify FISA rulings, or at least to summarize them. McClay's amendment failed 54 to 37. Also, Senator Patrick Leahy, a Democrat from Vermont, offered an amendment to shorten the period of reauthorization and actually strengthen the Inspector General's oversight, but that too failed, as did Senator Rand Paul, a Republican from Kentucky, who was seeking to add a statement protecting Americans from Fourth Amendment violations caused by third-party data collectors. Now, the Senate voted in favor of the FISA extension on Friday the 28th, and the pres and President Obama signed the bill into law on Monday the 31st. I know, like, the deadline. And while the future of government surveillance looks bleak, it should be noted that a few good things have come, at least in this latest round from the Senate. Now, there's broad support for making FISA more transparent. About half of the Senate is on record saying uh, that, the, you know, demanding disclosure. And FISA uh, opposition is finally bar bipartisan, with Republican Senator Rand Paul, Mike Lee, and Lisa Murkowski fighting the good fight. All right. Well, with all of that, let's get to the comment of the week. 404 On Air wrote in response to the story on Instagram's privacy policy change, the subsequent uproar and the change again, On Air writes, quote, the thing about Instagram didn't explain themselves very well is actually their lame excuse masking an attempt to test the limits of how far they can go with it. Do the users outrage, they turned to have it roll back and make a naive childish face the way like, oops, we didn't mean to do that. On Air continues, Actually, this year's course of events is somewhat symptomatic of the preparing privacy paradigm shift, especially the second half of it. There are a ton of privacy policy changes in various places, including Ubuntu's ads and the spyware so-called cloud version of the Cisco firmware for Linksys routers that also generated enough users' outrage to be abandoned later with almost the same excuse about good intentions and bad uh, explanations. So here's my question to you. Are we on the cusp of a 
privacy paradigm shift? Or has such a shift already happened and we're not just now waking up to smell the coffee? Or get this, in a world of web services run by mega corporations like Facebook and Google, can one truly maintain ownership and privacy online? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And remember, you can always find all of the ways to subscribe to ThreatWire at threatwire.org. And that's also where you can get involved with our Google Plus community because there's so much more happening than we can ever cover in a few minutes here on YouTube. That's where the conversation goes all week. So with all of that said, I'm Darren Kitchen and I'll see you on the internet. The reason that we hash um, passwords is to provide some kind of um, protection against recovery should those hashes be leaked. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like your last line of defense in a breach, right?